All right, so in tonight's video, we're going to be talking about how has the world become more interconnected in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. And I will admit to you that this visually, this PowerPoint is not going to be that exciting. But what we're going to be talking about a lot of is like, what is the world like that you live in today? Um, so let's think about after World War II, um, the capitalist victors, the people who won World War II, uh, wanted to avoid a return to the Great Depression. So, you know, after World War I, we had the Great Depression, and many people feared that this would be coming back. And we see a re-globalization of the economy after the contractions of the economy in the 1930s. So production goes down during the Great Depression, and everyone becomes very insular um, and protectionist. But now we start to see a re-globalization after World War II. Um, World trade was about $57 billion in 1947, and that's going to rise to $7 trillion in 2001. Um, so what we see during this era after World War II is a series of international organizations that are created um, to try to kind of lay the foundations for post-war globalization. And some of those groups are the International Monetary Fund. Some of them are the World Bank. Um, and this is kind of set, decided in 1944 in Brenton Wood, New Hampshire. Brenton spelled B-R-E-T-T-O-N, so Brenton Woods, New Hampshire. And they set up a series of institutions, like, like I just said, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And what these things did is they laid a foundation for a post-war globalization. And this was known as the Brenton Woods System. And they negotiated the rules for commercial and financial dealings amongst the capitalist countries. And some of the things they were focusing on was protecting free trade and creating a stable currency linked to the U.S. dollar and high levels of investment. And so the World Bank and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, would impose free market and pro-business conditions on poor countries um, in order for them to get loans. So basically, um, the poor developing countries in the world were allowed to get loans if they allowed for free market business. So they couldn't have tariffs. Um, and this was, some people feel that this actually was kind of harmful to the developing world. Some people uh, were very much against the idea of world trade because they thought that it didn't really help, um, like I said, the developing world. But what we start to see is a market operating globally and that kind of being the most effective way to gain economic growth, not just thinking about your own country, but thinking about the global um, economy. Technology also ex contributed to the acceleration of economic globalization. Um, so we see, you know, lots more shipping happening in the 19 in movement of goods and technology is going to help that. Uh, so containerized shipping, one of the things like having a standardized shipping container. So when you look at like sea tractor trailers with these huge containers on the back, that's the same container that the goods might have been shipped in across um, an ocean in a huge freighter. And so if you have standardized shipping, they become very easy to stack and it becomes very easy to move all of these goods around. So containerized shipping, huge oil tankers, and air express services dramatically lower transportation costs. We also start to see fiber optic cables and the internet providing a communication infrastructure and allowing for global interaction on a large scale. Um, the population growth that is tied to the growing economies and modernizing societies further helped globalization because now there's more people entering into the world economy. And what we have uh, post-World War II is something known as neoliberalism. And what that means is the reduction of tariffs. Tariffs are tax barriers placed on imported goods. Um, the free movement of capitalism. Mobile and a, temp a mobile and temporary workforce. The privatization of state-run enterprises, meaning government-owned companies are now becoming private. And a loose loosening up of government regulation on the economy. So lack of like a deregulation of the economy. Um, and as a result, money and goods have increased in mobility in three ways. So we see direct foreign investment. So you see U.S. firms opening factories in either China or Mexico. This exploded after 1960. A lot of companies take advantage of the cheap labor and the tax breaks and the looser environmental control. So you see a lot of manufacturing jobs are going to leave the U.S. in the 1960s and go to places like Asia or to Mexico because of these benefits. You also are going to see the short-term movement of capital. So investors are going to spend trillions of dollars buying foreign currencies or stocks that are likely to increase in value and sell them very quickly. So 
rather than kind of like investing in the in the long haul, kind of looking at the market prices and kind of selling, buying and selling stock very quickly in order to kind of make a huge profit, which is in some ways kind of um, like gambling. We're also going to see uh, the personal funds of individuals. In the end of the 20th century, international credit cards are everywhere, and this allows for easy transfer of money across borders. So those of you that have traveled outside the United States, you'll know that you know if your parents gave you your ATM card or your debit card, you could use it anywhere in the world. Um, so in 2003, MasterCard had 32 million businesses in 210 countries. Central to this acceleration of economic globalization was huge businesses known as transnational corporations. Um, and these transnational corporations, or TNC, are these huge companies that encompass multiple countries and they produce goods or deliver services simultaneously in many countries. So, for instance, a corporation, a corporation like Mattel, think about the toy company, makes Barbies in factories in Indonesia, Malaysia, and China using molds that were created in the United States with plastic and hair from Taiwan and cotton cloth from China. So we see that you know, so the company owns factories or distribution centers all across the globe. Um, and so your Barbie doll is made as an example of this international globalization. You have um, distribution centers in Hong Kong and more than 1 million Barbies in 150 countries by 1999. Um, other TNCs are Royal Dutch Shell, which is like Shell Gasoline Company, Sony, um, General Motors. Sometimes these companies are so big that they are actually dwarf countries. So um, in 2000, 51 of the world's hundreds, 100 largest economic units were TNCs, not countries. Um, and they can move facilities quickly from place to place in search of the lowest labor and the least restrictions. So we see that companies and businesses are on the move during this time period. Workers are also on the move um, post-World War II. So young women from poor countries are sometimes recruited as sex workers in wealthy nations, and they're living kind of in near slavery. We also see highly educated professionals like doctors and nurses and engineers and computer specialists leaving home in what we refer to as the Global South and moving to the north, to Europe or North America, looking for jobs and benefits. And uh, the flow of migrating workers actually creates a major source of income to the home countries. So for instance, we think about a lot of um, immigrants here in, um, from Mexico or from other places in Central and South America, they're sending money home and that becomes a major source of income to the home countries. And this means inexpensive labor for the adopted countries because they're not citizens, they don't have to be paid a minimal wage, but it also creates political and cultural tensions that we're seeing right now in this current um, political, uh, current uh, presidential election. Um, but the U.S. needs immigrants from places like Mexico and Latin America for farm and domestic labor because the pay scale is so low, settled Americans are never accepted to be paid for that kind of money. But a lot of issues is with these migrant workers that people don't want the migrant workers to stay when the work is done. They don't want them gaining the benefits of U.S. workers. So they want them to come, they want them to do their job, and then they want them to go back home. Um, but laws make it very difficult for foreigners to come in and almost impossible for them to stay. So that's why we see this massive amount of illegal immigration. Um, in 2006, we have 35 million foreign-born people legally in the United States, which is about 12% of the population. And then you have 11.6 million people roughly here illegally. Now, Europe is also beginning to experience this large-scale migration, um, and they weren't accustomed to this. But this comes with an economic boom after World War II. So because of the loss, you know, because of World War II, uh, we see low birth rates, but an expanding economy. So they welcomed foreigners to come in for work because they needed workers, but they didn't want to grant them citizenship. And many of these people were coming from their old colonies. So for instance, in 19, between 1953 and 62 in Britain, about 136,000 immigrants were coming in um, from the Commonwealth. Many of these immigrants that were coming in mostly from the West Indies and from India and Pakistan were attacked uh, by British, like teenagers and youth. Um, politicians would play to the racial sentiments and legislation was passed actually limiting immigration, especially immigrants of color. Um, in 1990, we have 2 million immigrants of South Asian and Caribbean descent. And by 2001, you have about 4.3 million people from overseas living in Great Britain. 
France also has a large um, immigrant population that at first was welcomed and then was restricted. So in 1990, you see about 615,000 people coming from Algeria, about 573,000 coming from Morocco, others were coming from Tunisia, from Senegal, and Mali. Uh, most of these, so these were all former French colonies. Most of these immigrants were Muslim. Um, and the tensions began to grow between the French and the immigrant, immigrant class. So there was a lot of class and racial and religious tensions. A lot of them settled in cities in some of, some of the worst urban housing. So even now, if you're a second generation or third generation, you know, from an immigrant family um, living in France, so you're considered a French citizen, you're born in France, but you're never considered French. Um, you're always going to be looked as an outsider. You're going to be discriminated against trying to find jobs. You're going to be living in pretty horrific slum type conditions. Um, but by 2006 in France, about 4 million, 4.9 million people in France were foreign born. So this is a large percentage of the French population that they really haven't managed to kind of like welcome into French society. This is a major problem um, that we're seeing in France today. So Germany had no major colonies, but they had the fastest growing European economy. And because of that, they had the greatest need for workers. So they accepted immigrants for a set period of time where they were allowed to come in for, say, like a couple of years, and then they were had to leave. It was impossible for them to gain citizenship. In 1973, you had about 4 million of these guest workers living in Germany. By 1996, you had about 7.3 million guest workers. They did the lowest paying jobs. They had the poorest housing. They were clustered in their own little neighborhoods. A third of them were from Turkey. Um, only after 1999 was it legal for someone without a German ancestor to become a citizen. It's still very difficult to gain citizenship in Germany. Um, but they do have a lot of people coming in because they have um, pretty easy asylum laws, so it might be easy to be able to come into Germany, but you, it's very difficult to get citizenship to stay in Germany long term. Italy, historically, um, is a country of emigration, meaning people were leaving Italy. So between 1876 and 1965, 25 million Italians emigrated, and if you are of Italian descent, you might, your ancestors might be in this number. Um, after World War II, most, much of this immigration was internal. So people living in southern Italy moving to northern Italy, because southern Italy typically tended to be uh, much more rural um, and uh, not as developed, and the north was much more urban. So Italy today has one of the lowest birth rates in the world, but has a growing economy, um, and so it offered opportunities to millions of immigrants in the 1980s. Um, until the 1990s, um, many were kind of left there by themselves, they weren't bothered. Um, but they entered. They were entering without permission. And in 1990, political parties in Italy began to restrict immigration. So with the EU, um, at least for Europe, that has created some issues of the freedom of movement. Um, well, this is EU, this is people accepting the, the Euro and EU members not accepting the Euro. But um, in 1990, you have something called the Schengen Agreement. S-C-H-E-N-G-E-N. -E so this is in 1990. And this meant that EU members had complete freedom of movement within the EU. So basically, once you crossed a border inside the, in, you know, into a European Union country, you had complete movement within the EU. So like if you were coming from the U.S. to France, say, flying in from the U.S. to France, you're going to go to border control through when you come into France. But say you're going from France to Germany, those are two EU countries, there's going to be no border control as you're crossing the border between France and Germany, which is kind of what the issues um, with in some of the terrorist attacks in France and in Belgium, because some of those terrorists lived in Belgium and they were able to easily cross over into France because of this agreement, because there's no border controls. Um, imports also, once inside the Union, can be bought and sold anywhere within the border. So something's being imported into Spain, the people who are importing it is going to pay a tariff at that point, but then there's not going to be any type of other imports tax or anything else, say if that product then went from Spain to Italy. Um, to ensure, but all the countries were supposed to be, um, follow strict limitations on immigration and the importation of goods. Um, violence and tensions did break out though between members of the EU. Um, the EU is kind of an interesting experiment right now. Europe, those of you who took European history, you know this, but Europe has had a history of fighting and bickering in constant wars with each other. So the idea that Europe has now come together as one big happy family is still kind of a strange thing. Um, but 
we do see violence break out between the various different groups uh, within the EU, in particular the Italians and the Romanians. Uh, on this map here, it doesn't look like Romania is a member of the EU, but in fact it is today. Uh, actually, no, it's not a part of the EU today, but um, no, Romania is, sorry. Um, but a lot of the Romanians were living in Italy in spotter camps around the major cities in Italy, and they were attacked by vigilantes. So like the Italians weren't happy with all these Romanian people coming into Italy looking for jobs. Um, and so political parties with anti-immigration platforms um, increased the numbers of seats in parliament in Italy. Um, as far as total in the world, there's about 50, between 15 and 20 million people that are currently refugees. 80% um, of that number is, is women and children. Um, you see this a lot also in Africa, uh, where people are trying to escape threats from oppressive governments. Um, so in the 2000s, people from Zimbabwe were fleeing Mugabe's government, who was um, a dictator in Zimbabwe. Between 2007 and 2008, so many crossed into South Africa that fighting broke out and governments passed laws limiting immigration. Because we're seeing this right now with the Syrian refugees, all of these immigrants coming in, all these um, refugees coming in kind of tends to destabilize the country. People tend to get upset because they feel they fear that they're taking jobs or they're going to change the ethnic makeup of the country. It also just creates a great deal of economic pressure because how do you take care, feed, and house all these extra people coming in who are escaping uh, war-torn countries? But I want you to think about how has the world become more interconnected as you move into the 20th and 21st centuries. And I'll see you guys in class.